in accounting unquoted equity in investments because at each reporting date, a fair valuation will be required, which may increase the cost of preparation of the financial statements. So this is a very important aspect as regards IS, IFRS 9 uh, valuation model is concerned. So that is something I just wanted to highlight that uncoded equity investments may become a problem under IFRS 9. Okay, so the equity instruments are quite simple. Now let's go to the debt instruments accounting. As I said, under IS 39, a debt instruments can be classified into various categories. It can be classified as held for trading, it can be classified as loan and receivable, it can be classified as held to maturity, it can be classified as AFS, depending on the uh, conditions and depending on the intentions of the management. And this is something which is, a, which, was, which is a cause of concern during the financial crisis because when you change the categories, it has an impact on the PL account. And the way uh, it is, uh, the rules revolves around under IS 39 for intercategory transfers. Uh, you know, sometimes situations become quite complicated to apply in practice. So therefore, as to achieve the simplicity objective, as I said, the, under IFRS 9, the amortized cost accounting is allowed only f when the two conditions are met, and the conditions, you know, as I also explained briefly, is asset is held within a business model whose objective is to collect the contractual cash flows, and number two, the contractual terms of the instrument give rise to cash flows at specified dates that are solely payment of principal and interest. So these two conditions apparently mean that simple debt instruments like loans and receivables where the cash flows only comprise of interest payment and the principal repayment would tend to meet this classification as amortized cost. Otherwise, in most of the situations, the uh, debt instruments would require to be carried at fair value through the PNL account. Now let's discuss this business model test in some, you know, in some detail. Now, uh, the business model of an entity may be to collect all contractual cash flows from the financial asset or to sell financial assets and realize the fair value changes. There can be two kinds of objectives attached to the, any business model uh, which deals with the financial instrument. Either the financial assets are held to collect the contractual cash flows or the financial assets are held for selling purposes in the near term to realize the fair value changes. Now, the first kind of business objective can be easily associated with entities like traditional banks like entities uh, which hold instruments uh, uh, to collect cash flows over a long period is strategic purposes. And there are certain entities like where, which deals extensively in buying and selling and trading and the objective of carrying the financial assets is not to carry them till their ultimate maturity but to realize it and realize the gain from market changes in the fair value. Now, this gives rise to a question that can business model test be applied on a whole entity basis or on a portions of the entity? Meaning, are we saying that each entity will have only one business model or an entity may, may have multiple business models? Now, which is the case basically, an entity may have multiple business models because you know, take an example of a bank where the business model of a treasury division may be different from a business model of a corporate lending division. So an entity may have different business models. So this business model test should be applied on a portfolio basis rather than on a reporting entity basis. So when applying the business model test, the entity has to see on a portfolio basis, on the portfolio of financial assets maintained by the entity, that whether the portfolio is held to collect the contractual cash flows or the whether the portfolio is held to, uh, for selling purposes or for, for actively trading in the market. Now, this 
as you can observe, is different from the IS-39 approach, where the classification as held to maturity or held to trading is not on a portfolio basis or not on business model basis, is on the intention which is determined on an instrument by instrument basis. So each for each instrument, the entities take a decision whether the instrument is held to maturity or is for trading purposes. And that is based on the management's intentions rather than their business model. So here, the difference is that the distinction between assets which are held to collect contractual cash flows or for selling purposes is made on the basis of the entity's business model. And a business model is something which you can't change very easily. You can't turn around tomorrow and say this instrument was, say, held to maturity, but, you know, after one year, uh, there is urgent liquidity requirement, and my intention proved to be wrong, so I am just selling this instrument. Here, we are talking about business model. So, unless you change your business model, you will not be able to classify or reclassify any instrument from one category to another category. So, this is more factual, meaning if an entity has decided what is its business model with regard to the portfolio of financial assets maintained by it? So that business model will remain for a long period of time unless there are fundamental changes in the way the entity operates. The business model will not change. If the business model will not change, the classification of the financial assets will also not change, meaning for all times to come, a financial asset that is classified at amortized cost will remain at amortized cost and the financial asset which is classified at fair value will remain at fair value. So this will reduce the opportunity uh, with the preparers of financial, uh, financial statements to play around with the categories to achieve uh, specific profit motives. Now, business model test does not mean that if you have declared you, that this portfolio of assets is held to to collect all the contractual cash flows, so you would not be able to sell anything out of that portfolio for all times to come. The standard recognizes that due to liquidity needs, some portions of the portfolio can be sold out, or sometimes, say for example, if you have a, even you have an objective to collect all the cash flows, but sometimes because of the quality of the asset, the quality of the loan, has gone below the required standard which the entity has established for itself. For example, you want all assets to be of certain grade, A rated, B rated, C rated. So if the asset uh, is no more uh, A rated, you might want to sell that asset. And therefore, some selling out of the portfolio does not mean that your business model uh, <clears throat> has to change. Actually, if there are in, is, is more than frequent selling out of the portfolio, this will itself give rise to a question whether your, uh, uh, your declaration or your uh, assessment about the business model was correct or not. For example, uh, on the very uh, inception of classification of any instrument, if you have assessed that this instrument belongs to a portfolio which is held to collect contractual cash flows, and then uh, there is a uh, uh, this is this is this is a frequent selling out of that portfolio on in each year. So this will raise a question whether your assessment about the business model for that portfolio was correct or not. And if not, you need to change the business model assessment. But in normal circumstances, business model does not mean that you would not be allowed to sell anything out of that portfolio. So it's still, uh, a business, if the overall objective, if the overall objective of the business model is to collect contractual cash flows, you can still classify uh, that instrument under that portfolio, and it will meet the business model test for classification as amortized cost. So first test, the business model test, and the second test is that about the asset itself. What is the characteristics of the asset? The standard says that uh, in order to meet the nature of asset test, 
the debt instrument should give rise on specific dates to cash flows that are solely interest, meaning interest is a consideration for the time value of money plus any credit risk premium on the instrument. So the cash flows should represent either interest and the repayment of a principal. Now, there are certain instruments, there's a, a whole list of uh, instruments which is given in the application guidance uh, where certain kind of debt instruments would not meet this test, which appear to be a debt instrument, but due to certain characteristics, uh, it may be easily concluded that the return from the instrument is not solely interest and repayment of principal, but is more than that. Now, for example, what are those instruments? A bond convertible into equity. A bond convertible into equity normally gives you return which is more than interest, market interest rate. This is because uh, a premium is charged for the equity conversion option. So therefore, the return received on a convertible bond is not solely interest, it's not solely for the time consideration for the time value of money and the credit risk premium, but also a premium for the equity conversion option with the holder. Therefore, uh, since the return is not solely uh, interest and the repayment of principal, a convertible bond will not meet the definition of, uh, would not meet this test and therefore would not meet, uh, the, uh, would not be eligible to be classified under the amortized cost basis but have to be fair valued. Then there are certain debt instruments which pays interest sometimes not in line with the market interest rates. So they do not pay you, you know, in Pakistan it's very rare to find those instruments, but you know, talking internationally, there are certain instruments which pay you interest rate which is inverse to the market interest rate. So these kind of leverage which is inbuilt into those debt instruments will disqualify that debt instrument for classification as amortized cost. Then the derivative instruments, swaps, options, futures, etc., will not meet this test and therefore would need to be fair valued. Uh, debt instruments which defer interest payments and the deferred interest payments if not carry further interest, a consideration for time value of money, meaning that the return that you're receiving is not entirely compensation for the time value of money, may also result in disqualification uh, uh, of accounting as amortized cost basis. So, you know, the theme is that only plain vanilla kind of loans and debt instrument will meet the nature of asset test and all other fantastic leverage products, fancy products uh, will normally not meet the requirement for measurement as amortized cost and has to be fair valued uh, in the financial statements. Okay, so the kind of instruments that will meet the, this test is instrument with fixed maturity, with fixed rate of interest, normal loan, instruments carrying variable market rates, say Kyber Plus basis, instruments carrying variable market interest subject to a cap, even uh, if the instrument carries market interest rate and there is a subject to a floor, again, this is a combination of interest which is fixed and variable but it's still the compensation is for the time value of money and the credit risk premium, meaning this instrument will still meet the, the, the requirement for, uh, elig for eligibility as amortized cost basis. So in short, you know, the debt instruments will, will be measured on an amortized cost basis, on a fair value basis, and for amortized cost measurement, the entity has to demonstrate that how it meets these two conditions of business model test and nature of asset test. All other instruments will have to be measured at fair value. Okay, I think uh, I've just been told that we have to take a uh, break for Maghrib prayers. So I think, uh, let's take this break and I think we'll back by 15 minutes? 20 minutes? Okay. So, okay, we'll resume after 20 minutes then. Uh, le let me have one more announcement after the 
Maghrib prayer, we'll have a question answer session. In fact, we'll invite your questions in two different phases. The first question answer session will be immediately after the Maghrib namaz. And the second one will be at the end of the session.